Hello there, I'm George Hall, and a very warm and festive welcome to the Good Growth Podcast. We have a slightly different episode in store for you today, as in front of me I have two things. One is a list of 10 questions on e-commerce, and the other is Joe Hyder, ex-Coca-Cola and Unilever, and now Consultant Director at Good Growth. Joe, thank you very much for joining me today. Absolute pleasure, George. Uh, so, as we all know, Christmas is a time for reflection, celebration, and looking ahead. And I'm hoping that in me asking and you answering these 10 questions, we'll do a little bit of all of those. Uh, how are you feeling? Nervous? Reflective? Excited? All of the above? Festive and, and excited. Good. Well, it's a brilliant mix. Um, listen, I'm, I'm really looking forward to getting your insights on these 10 questions and your thoughts. So we'll get cracking. Um, looking back at 2022, the year that was... Are there any particular e-com brands that have stood out for you? Or is there a brand that you think they've done a really great job this year? So, yeah, there is actually. So um, as a dog owner, I spend mm-hmm. a lot of time walking. Comfortable footwear, fairly key. Of course. Um, All Birds has appeared incessantly in my Facebook feed. Um, and I love how easy they make it to buy. So I'm slightly obsessed with barriers to purchase friction everyone that knows me knows I talk about friction a lot Mm -hmm. and all birds have put everything into their PDP that you could want so that you really do not have to be distracted at all Um, and I love it it's just so easy it surfaces everything you might need to know and more in one place multiple images catwalk video delivery information costs and timelines I can tell whether it's going to fit me or not all of those things without hampering conversion so for me that's exactly what I want. Nice. So that, that gets my vote. Perfect. That sounds very good. And then similarly, looking forward to the next 12 months, are there any brands on your radar that you think we should be watching out for in terms of what they're going to do in the e space? So again, that friction point. Mm-hmm. So interestingly, the advertising caught my eye. Ryland's shiny teeth caught my eye. Uh, Ryland's shiny teeth as in Ryland of, of, of X Factor fame. Is this who we're talking about? Violin of X Factor fame and Kazoo <laughs> fame now. Of course. So, so buying a car should be really exciting. Yeah. And it can be. Um, and it generally is if you're buying completely new. But let's face it, most of the time we're not buying completely new. Sure. And then suddenly you spend all this time doing all this research, you find the car that ticks all the boxes that you get really excited about, and then you find out that it's 500 miles away. Uh, and unless you're my brother, frankly, you're not going to drive 500 miles to find out if you like it. <laughs> but it's OK, because Kazoo are going to bring it to you. Bring it in a truck, have it to try for seven days. And if you don't like it, give it back. Perfect. Perfect. Well, keep an eye. It's a, it's a saturated market, but it's a, it's a name that I know. And you're, you're quite right. It's because of Ryland's teeth. <laughs> and then moving on, whilst we're on the subject of 2023, what do you think the biggest e-com challenge is going to be for retailers in the next 12 months? So this is a really interesting question. And what struck me over the last couple of weeks is how busy the shops are. Yeah. And if you think about the last couple of years, mm-hmm. we've not we've not been able to go out and shop in person that much. I'm very quiet. Um, and e-com enjoyed, I suppose, this boom where people who weren't e-com shoppers suddenly had to be. But at the end of the day, we are all humans. And, and part of being human is the fact that we're a social species. Sure. And so... Actually, there's something about going out and doing the shopping. There's that dopamine buzz you get from carrying loads of bags and going, hee hee, I've just spent loads of money. I know the one. Um, If there's a way of making the shopping experience really pleasurable in store, then why wouldn't you? It's hard to replicate that online. So what I think is that one of the biggest challenges is how do you make shopping online as pleasurable as offline, assuming it is, and maybe it's about just thinking it through a little bit more, sort of shifting channel strategies and okay. bricks and mortar becomes a kind of showrooming strategic role and online becomes a conversion channel. But I think that's something to look out for as people you know, want to get back to being normal. And I guess following on from that, something that's really important for customer experience, particularly in store, is, is customer service and what's offered to the consumer. Does customer service still have a place in e-com in 2023? 
Oh my gosh, customer service is going to have a role in 2023, 24, 25, George, forever. Forever. Customer service always has a place. And I am really disappointed by the number of businesses who are still using COVID as an excuse for understaffing. I know there's a staffing issue, sure. but I suspect in a lot of cases, this is for a financial commercial decision yeah. with reduced opening hours and, and just really slow response times. And it's time to recognise the value of customers. Again, customers have a choice and we should genuinely be serving them. That is my plea. And then a, a theme that I keep seeing in the industry press, in all of the online uh, magazines and journals, is personalisation and how important personalisation is going to be for, for e-com retailers and in particular for D2C sites. Do you agree with this? Do you see personalisation as being a key theme? Yeah, I mean, I think I think customer expectations are just rising. So they understand now that mass personalization is possible. Mm -hmm. um, I think the good news is that they also understand that personalization costs and there seems to be a, a willingness to pay a premium for that. Um, but there's also, in some sectors, a real desire to be actively involved in the design process, which makes personalization much more than just embossing a name, for example. And I suppose what comes with that then is the is the fact that people want to show off Absolutely. what they've bought. So it becomes this brilliant little circular um, dynamic where you're spending money with a brand, you're personalising, and then you're advertising it for them. So I think it's a really interesting trend. Something that's really caught my eye in, in Nike store in London is, and they've got a fancy name for it, and I can't remember what it is, but it's the idea that you can essentially recycle your, your Nikes. So you take in a pair of almost dying shoes mm -hmm. and you pimp them to, to breathe new life into them. So it's this mixture between personalization, but also a real step in the right direction towards sustainability and nice. accepting that we can't just you know, throw everything away. Sure. Um, so I think that's a really interesting angle too. Well, we talk about personalization as a key theme and, and something that also keeps popping up is, is payment options. So things like Klarna have had a really strong boost over the last few years particularly in the cost of living crisis, how important do you think payment options will be for e-com retailers this year? Well, it comes back to that friction point. You've, you've done all of that hard work in capturing somebody's attention, getting them to consider you, mm -hmm. getting them through the door, mm -hmm. getting them to put you in your basket, getting so close. And then, oh, you don't accept such and such, or you just make it difficult. So, you know, as many payment options as you can, I think the challenge is how you surface that in your checkout without making the checkout appear confusing and therefore off-putting. Um, but yeah, absolutely, a, a variety of options. And Klarna is really interesting. It's been around for a few years now, and I think it's becoming a very accepted form yeah. of spreading the payment. Uh, why wouldn't you? We touched on something interesting there with the sustainability point around Nike. Do you think that the importance of sustainability is going to take a bit of a back seat uh, during the cost of living crisis? I really hope not. Um, I think and I hope that customers will expect both. Sure. Um, sustainability isn't a luxury to be switched on and off. And I think the last year or two, anyone that says, you know, we don't need to be focusing on this is just sticking their head in the sand. And <laughs> we, we've all got to do the right thing. However, it, it won't happen if there is a significant price premium. No. So there's a responsibility on businesses to find the right balance. And I think there's some really interesting developments, particularly in fashion. Uh, so aside from the example I, I gave with Nike, there's, there's a really cool uh, company called Rent the Runway. Okay. I, I won't be a customer, but if I wanted <laughs> to design addresses, uh, then I could rent one rather than buy one. Brilliant. Sure. Why spend £2,000 on a dress you're going to wear a couple of times? Uh, um, there's also um, some more accessible ones. Lululemon have got a yeah. um, like new initiative and okay. Patagonia have got warm wear. So, so I think all of these things are, you know, people are starting to realise that fashion's part of the problem. It creates an awful lot of waste. Sure. Um, so if there's a way to, you know, breathe new life into things and, and you know, reduce the footprint, be more sustainable in the process, mm -hmm. I think customers will embrace that because why wouldn't you? So we've mentioned a few key themes and a few buzzwords. Uh, the one that I haven't touched on yet, which I will now, is, is omnichannel. Um, what would you say to retailers who aren't yet investing in omnichannel activity? I would say you're mad. <laughs> it's like having multiple sales teams competing for, a, for the same customer. Sure. 
Um, you need one team working together on that one customer. And, you know, a customer doesn't think, oh, now that's the store. Oh, no, this is the, you know, this is the website or this is the wholesale version, wh whatever the channel might be. They just see you. They just see one brand. They're having one conversation as far as they're concerned. So retailers have got to find a way to allow and enable and potentially promote for the customer to move seamlessly between channels and pick that conversation up wherever the wherever the customer left off and you know it's a it's a housekeeping factor it's not a nice to have and now into the into the real business end of these questions the real important ones um joe hyder have you finished your christmas shopping yet this year no i haven't and the reason is is that christmas does not start until uh, until december the first that was yesterday <laughs> debatable right? So I started my Christmas shopping yesterday. Okay. And before you ask, the last thing I bought online, Secret Santa gift. Can't tell you who it's for, though. <laughs> well, you see, that was my 10th question. Uh, for all of you avid listeners at home there, I was going to ask Jo Hyder what was the last thing she bought online. I was hoping to get a, a retail guru's thoughts on what was fashionable and trendy to buy this year. But alas, we shall live on in, in, uh, in not knowing. Joe Hyder, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on the podcast today. Your answers have been fantastic and insightful as always. Hope to have you back on soon. Uh, and all that's left from me is to wish you a, a very happy Christmas and a wonderful new year. And a Merry Christmas to you, George. Thanks, Joe.